Good morning, uh, dear students. So let us get to have a study on this uh, topic, marine ecology. I am aware that we would have done one or two lectures before the lockdown on this particular um, course. I, bet I want us to listen uh, to this video. Uh, anywhere you are not getting very clearly, just pause and listen again. Uh, this course is MSM 3831, Marine Ecology. Marine Ecology. So two words are used to form this course, Marine and Ecology. Marine, of course, you know you are in the Marine Sciences, so you should know what Marine is. It has to do with a body of water that has a salinity that uh, is at least above, uh, that has some level of salt. Anyway, that has some level of salt. Anything above 0 0.05 parts per thousand. Now, the other one we need to know there is ecology. What is actually ecology? Ecology, simply put, is the study of ecosystem. Logos means study. That echo there is ecosystem. So ecology in a nutshell is the study of ecosystem. So what is an ecosystem? Any unit might be as large as the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean might be as small as a little hole in the wood. Where there's interaction, okay, between one between living things and non-living things in one hand, and then among the living things. So, a unit of interaction. So, when we study that unit of interaction in a marine environment, then you are talking of marine ecology. All right. So, let's get to the first lecture. The first lecture, I want to talk about the basic principles basic ecological principles there are some basic ecological principles that we need to study when you get to an ecosystem there are key players okay there are key players because we just mentioned that it's an interaction a unit of interaction between the living things and the non-living things in one hand and then among the living things, how they impact one another, how they influence one another, okay? So there are key players. The major key players are living things and non-living, the biotic and abiotic factors. But they could be split, especially among the living things, because we say among the living things. Especially among the living things, you have the producers, the consumers, the decomposers. Then the living things are more, the non-living things are more of, in form of energy, or biomass, okay, basically. All right, so let's talk about the energy. The energy here is the main factor that everything is impacting on each other. The energy can be in form of solar, Okay, solar energy. It can also be in form of food, nutrients. Okay, and that is exactly what the producers use to kickstart the process of production. And every other one depends on what the producer has done. So the producers are called the autotrophs. Auto means self, trough means feeding. So autotrophs are those organisms that feed themselves. They are self-feeding. Now, in bean producers, they can do that by the use of light, photo. And then we say that they are photosynthetic. To synthesize means to compound to bring A and B to make C. 
to bring to bring in together the, or the, the the simple components and then make a complex component that is to synthesize to make complex from simple so they are autotrophs they are photosynthetic they use light to synthesize Okay, and then they are more than 90% of the autotrophs. But then you still have the chemotrophs or chemo, the chemo autotrophs. The chemo autotrophs are chemosynthetic. Now, what it means that they use chemicals to also synthesize. So, whether they are using light or they are using chemicals, they are autotrophs. They are primary producers. Okay. So they kick start. Now the other ones are called the consumers. The consumers now begin to depend on whatever the producers have produced. They, they are called heterotrophs. Hetero means others. Troph means feeding. So they feed from others. They don't feed from self. They feed from others. Now, but this or this or uh, heterotrophs are also divided into stages. There are those that are called the primary consumers. They are the herbivores. They feed directly from the producers. Then you have the carnivores, those ones that feed on the herbivores. Then you have the omnivores. The omnivores are higher there. They can eat. They can feed on the plant. Or they feed on the animal that feed on the plants. Then we have the decomposers. The decomposers are microbes. What do they do? They try to return, okay? Because at the point of production, the whole system, the whole organism has become complex. Whether it's a plant or an animal, it has become complex. Now, but the decomposer will decompose it. Now, bringing this complex into simple and then returning these simple materials that the producers need. They turn it back to them to now start again in a cycle, the process of production. So, the decomposers return nutrients. They return nutrients because the producer don't just only need the photo. They also need the nutrients to be able to to to, to to, to kickstart the process of producing in, in, in that ecosystem. So these stages or things are also known as the, the trophic levels or the, 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 the food levels or the and it can be in form of food chain or food web. Now food chain is a linear feeding relationship. With the assumption that an organism feeds only on another organism and is being fed by only one other organism. That's, that's a linear relationship. For example, you say that grass is being eaten by sheep, sheep is being eaten by lion. That is a linear feeding relationship. But all we know, but we all know that. Grass, the, 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 the sheep is not the only organism that can feed on grass. And in other words, the grass is not only being fed on by sheep alone. There are other ones. And that is why we have the food web. Food web is more complex, but it's more realistic. Okay? So it's a form of a web, like a spider web, with all the linkages trying to bring in all the possible consumers and all the possible uh, trees in that feeding relationship. All right. Now, there's something that we need to know here. Uh, the process of energy transfer in an ecosystem. I hope you can see this uh, picture very well. And I want to do some illustration with this picture, and it's very important. 
energy is being transferred. Okay, and that is why, why we have the law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created, you know, or lost, but it can be moved from one form to another. Okay. And then the second one says that energy, a particular state, a particular trophic level, can only be quit a percentage of what it has. Okay, it cannot give off everything that it has, it can only give out a percentage. In fact, ecologists have come to say that. In the process of releasing energy or biomass to the next level, about 80 to 95 percent is lost, and only 10 percent is transferred. Now, using this picture as an illustration, you can see this the primary source of energy, the solar. Now, the solar energy hits the surface of the sea through the radiant energy okay now let's say it's 5,000 units of radiant energy do you know that out of this 5,000 units only 2% is utilized only 2% is utilized 98% is lost okay now the primary producers will use this 2% to produce for example 10 units of energy. 10 units of energy. Okay? The primary producers. Now, out of these 10 units of energy, they can only release 10%. 10% to the next level in the definitive relationship. They can only release 10%. So, 10% of 10,000 is just 1,000. So the primary consumers, for example, the the copy pots, okay, the primary consumer like the copy pot, the, the, the zoo planting, can only get 10,000 units out of the original. They can only get 1,000 units out of the original 10,000 units. So they use it to now produce 100 percent, okay. And out of that, they can now also release only 10% of that 1,000. Only 10% of that 1,000 to the next level. So the next level, like the anchovies, the small, small fishes, can only get 100 units out of the 1,000 units that the zoo plantains have. And in return, can only release 10 units out of the 100 units, that 10% of 100, 10 units to the bigger fishes of there. Okay? So, by the time the fisherman, after toiling all the days, catches the fish, is only getting 1 unit of the original 10,000 units that was produced by the primary producers. Because... The bigger fish can also only release 10 units of energy. Okay, now other ones are used for other things reproduction, loss through heat, you know, movement, a lot of things, growth also. Okay, and a lot of things. Now that is why the fishes that it feed directly because there can also be some big fishes that we feed on the on on the on the on the on the phytoplankton. Okay, the fishes that feed directly on the plants have better quality, have better nutrients, have better and more qualitative biomass than the ones that feed on the ones that feed on the ones that feed on the plant. So that is how 
the energy is transferred in a marine ecosystem. Now let's quickly discuss some biotic structures and ecosystem model. The first one we want to talk about is the ecological niche. What is an ecological niche? An ecological niche is the match of a species to a specific environmental condition. It describes, listen, it describes how an organism or population responds to the distribution of resources and competitors and how it in turn alters those same factors. Simply put, an ecological niche is the role of an organism in a particular habitat or ecosystem. All right, so the next one is spatial richness. What is spatial richness? Spatial richness simply means the number of species. The number of species, the quantity, the numeric, the numerical strength of that species. That's the richness. Now, but diversity, species diversity, is not just the number. It talks about the distribution. It talks about the richness. Okay? And also, the total number of the individual among the species, that the, in, that the evilness. Now, what it means is this. If in two different environments, you have the same number of species, you have the same number of abundance, okay? But in one, in one sample or in one environment, One of the species is dominant. Let's say you here you have 100, here you also have 100. But in this one, out of that 100, you have only two types. One is 90, the other one is 10. Or one is 90, or maybe you have three types. One is 90, the other one is 5, the other one is 5. But in the other one, you have about 10 different species. One is 9, the other one is 11, the other one is 13, and you have about 10 different types of them. Now, the one that has 10 different types has species diversity, more than the one that has only 3 different types. Yet, in terms of richness, both of them are the same. Alright, so what is ecological succession? Ecological succession is just a community change over time. A community change over time. And it is facilitation model that describes it more. Which says that each community modifies the environment, making it suitable for the next community until a climax community is formed. So, ecological succession is that change that takes place over time until a climax community is formed. And this facilitation model says that a community modifies the environment, making it suitable for the next community until that climax community is formed. Now, what is inhibition model? Inhibition model says that whichever species gets to a site first holds it against later settlers holds it against, in other words, they try to colonize and they try to stop other ones from coming to also come to settle. What is tolerance model? Tolerance model says that any colonizer species are not necessarily and in any, in any, it said any colonizing species are not necessary and any species can start succession. So, you don't need any particular one to start colonizing first. Now, community change can only occur as small tolerant or competitively superior species prevail. 
So anyone can be coming, you know, and inhabiting, but you can only get, you can only get a climax um, community when a superior or more tolerant one comes into play and then begins to colonize and then form a climax community. Now that this uh, law we want to state briefly is called the Libic's Law of the Minimum. It says that the growth of organism will be limited by a single factor, a single factor that is present in the lowest concentration relative to or pro in proportion to the requirement of that organism. Now, what he's trying to say is this. If a particular organism needs a particular uh, factor to grow, to grow, and that particular factor is in lowest concentration, then that factor is capable of limiting the growth of that organism. So it's called the Liebig's law of the minimum. All right. We also know that in an ecosystem, of course, there is no ecosystem if there are no interaction. In an ecosystem, there are laws of interaction. One of these interaction is called competition. What is competition? Competition simply means organisms using a resource that is in short supply. Now, if this resource is in excess, there's no need for competition. You take my, your own, I will take my own. There's no need for, for competition. But if it is in short supply, that is where competition comes in. All right. Now, this competition can be intraspecific. Intra means within the same species. Within the same species. Let's say Alodis trigona is competing with Alodis trigona. Nereus diversicolor is competing with Nereus diversicolor. The same species competing within itself. That is called intraspecific. But it can also be interspecific between different species. For example, Calinectis uh, amatum, for example, competing with Macuma macuma. Or Tympanotonus fuscatus competing with uh, uh, Pacmelania orita. One species competing with another species. All right. I hope it's very clear now. Now, let's talk about the competitive exclusive principle. Let me read it out slowly. This principle was propounded by Georgie Gauss. Georgie Gauss. And that is why it is also called Gauss's Law. Georgie Gauss. Georgie is G-E-O-R-G-Y. Georgie. Gauss is G-A-U-S-E. He propounded this. And that is why it's called Gauss's law. Now, it states that two species competing for the same limited resource cannot coexist at constant population value. Now, when one species has even the slightest advantage over another, the one with the, ad the, one with the advantage will dominate in long term. So, they cannot exist over a long time. They cannot coexist because the one that has even the slightest advantage will dominate the other one. Now, this leads to either the extinction of the weaker competitor or an evolutionary or behavioral shift towards a different ecological niche. That is exactly what that law is saying. Alright, now another form of interaction is also in predation. Predation simply means eating, and the opposite of predation 
is prey. So the predator hunts and kills and eats the prey. The prey is being hunted and killed and eaten by the predator. Most times the predator, predators are cannibals. Most times. Most times. And the prey, most times, are carnivore or omnivores. But a carnivore can also prey upon another, another carnivore. And going deeper too, if an animal feeds on sessile animals or plants, it's also predating. All right. Now we also have what they call the keystone predator. In the first instance, what is a keystone species? A keystone species is a species which has the which has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment relative to its abundance. In other words, by virtue of its number, by virtue of its abundance, it has a huge influence over its natural ecosystem, over its natural environment. It is called a keystone species. But there are also keystone predators. Keystone predators, for example, the wolf, the sea otter, they keep the population and the range of their prey in check because, they, because of their number and the way they prey upon those organisms. They keep the population in check. They keep their range in check. They are called keystone predators. Then the last thing we want to discuss here is about parasitism. Parasitism has to do with uh, depending on another one and in doing that, transmitting disease to it. Okay, so you cannot talk of parasitism without talking about disease. You can't talk about parasitism without talking about disease. Alright, so this is where we want to stop for now. Thank you so much.